Well, welcome to uh, African Philosophy Conversations. And it is my great pleasure to be talking to Dr. Gail Presby. I have known Dr. Presby uh, for a long time. Uh, we were in Kenya together uh, in the 90s. Um, and we have been at, uh, uh, I've lost count of the number of conferences we've been at <laughs> together and uh, all, all sorts of uh, interactions and, and uh, you know, thinking through issues in African philosophy and so forth. And so it's a real pleasure to, to talk to Dr. Presby today because she has such a wealth of experience, um, some of it overlapping with mine, but much of it not, much of it in areas that I um, you know, uh, did not do, especially one that I wanna talk about, which is uh, uh, sage philosophy as it was done in the field. And so welcome, uh, Dr. Presby, thank you for being with me today. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks for inviting me. I, I look forward to this and I also look forward to your, your students and anyone else who's watching the video, uh, welcome. And I'm glad to have this chance to share with you my interest in African philosophy. Yeah, great, wonderful. So the question I'd like to start with um, is the, really the question of how you got into philosophy in general and what brought you to African philosophy in particular. Okay, so well, I have to begin by crediting my dad who uh, went to the, the university I now teach at, University of Detroit Mercy. And he studied philosophy just out of his interest. I mean, I think the Jesuits made everybody study philosophy, but he had a lot of philosophy books in the basement. And as a teenager, when I was 13 years old, he handed me my first philosophy book that was actually on the pragmatist. It was called The Practical Cogitator. And I read through that whole book I loved, like Emerson and Thoreau. And I became, a, in high school, a fan of Thoreau. And I read on the duty of civil disobedience. And I got very interested in social and political philosophy and movements for justice. And so, because of those interests, I got interested in uh, decolonization movements because those were movements for justice. And that got me into some interest in Africa. I also wasn't, I got interested in critiquing Eurocentrism hmm. because um, I, I had an interest in world religions when I was in high school. I, I had some good teachers and I felt like I had had this uh, Christian upbringing and I knew through Christianity that there was a critique of the injustice of the world and not just acts of charity. So the reason there was so much poverty, et cetera, was due to this systemic endemic injustice and Christianity mm. wanted to address that. Mm. But it was only through my study of world religions I realized other world religions have other critiques of injustice that come from perspectives that Christianity didn't have. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I read about, you know, nonviolence and vegetarianism, something I didn't hear about in my Christianity. And so I became very interested in world religions. And so through all of that, uh, I was interested in Afri African philosophy at first, the decolonization issues, violence and nonviolence, Fanon, Kwame Nkrumah, et cetera, but also other issues. And really uh, one of my interests in Odero Ruka had to do because he was interested in critiquing uh, the prison system as it was in Africa as I mean, there's a need for a critique of the prison system around the world, but he was addressing those issues and issues of environment. And so it's because of my interest in ethics and social and political philosophy that I became a very interested in African philosophy as well. Wow. So your, your trajectory into African philosophy is maybe a little bit different from some other people's, uh, probably mine included, I guess, which was you know, and we were talking earlier about, you know, some people kind of stumbled into philosophy, or it was even in some cases, a second best sort of, you know, they their, their plan A was to be a lawyer or to be something else. And it sounds to me like you really, I mean, it was it was the these really philosophical issues and these really kind of 
uh, social issues and even, dare I say, religious issues that brought you to philosophy and then to African philosophy, and I think many others as well. I mean, you're not just working in African philosophy either. Right, and I, you know, so like I said, I have to credit my dad. He had that great books, you know, that Mortimer right. Adler had this huge thing, and he said, we have to go through the syntopicon, 100 topics. We had to start with angels or wow. something like that. So I have to admit, not everybody had a dad like my dad, you know. Uh, so, th so that was a great influence. But I, I can also think that as a child, I was very curious. Mm. I used to tell my parents, how do I know that the world didn't shrink to half its size overnight because if it shrank to half its size everything would be to scale and how would we know mm -hmm. like i used to go around as a kid asking questions like this well, so still, i was glad that there question. was a few <laughs> yeah now you mentioned a name um earlier and that was uh uh odera aruka and, and i want to get into that a little bit you know mainly because you are one of the people who actually worked with aruka and he passed away he was he was killed in a, a, a road accident in 1995 but you worked with him before uh before his death and he's well known for the sage philosophy project he's he he did other things than that as well certainly uh, and you've mentioned some of those already, but can you tell us a little bit about um, how Oruka conceived of sage philosophy? Wh why why he conceived of it? Uh, you know what it's um, you know what it was about. Um, you know uh, uh, we'll get into some of the nitty gritty on that, but just start us off. What what is sage philosophy? Okay, first let me tell you how I even found out sage philosophy existed, okay. and then Great. I will tell you what it is. Because really, the, the bridge, the link for me to even know that there was such a thing was a common friend of ours, Emmanuel Eze. Because I went to Fordham University for graduate school, and mm -hmm. Emmanuel was also there. Mm -hmm. And none of my coursework covered African philosophy. Right. So I really learned it existed from a fellow student. Who's, he told me one day, I'm giving a paper on African philosophy at a conference downtown, you know, in Manhattan. I think it was Baruch. He goes, You want to come? I'm like, What's African philosophy? <laughs> so I went and I loved it. I think Sylvia Federici was there. There were all these exciting papers. And I became very interested in these African issues. And Emmanuel, also told me to read all these novels. So I was reading Wole mm. Suinka and all these others. And so he was a big influence on me. And then there was this annual conference called Philosophy Born of Struggle. Mm -hmm. It was focusing on African American issues and philosophy. Leonard Harris. And I was there once at the New School, Lucius Outlaw was there. And I told him how I was so interested in African philosophy. He goes, well then, you should go to Kenya and you should find Odero Aruka. And uh, he had known, first of all, Lucius Outlaw had been researching it, uh, African philosophy since late 70s, early 80s. <laughs> he was one of the ones who, who got uh, groups of African philosophers to the US to dialogue <laughs> with African American philosophers. So he knew a lot of them. He had hosted Dara Ruka for a year at his university at Haverford. And so he goes, if you're interested, you should go to Kenya and you should learn from a Dara Ruka. I thought, how am I going to get to Kenya? <laughs> but I was just lucky that I had a couple of opportunities because my next door neighbor in the Bronx had worked for the United Nations, for UNICEF. And they just transferred her to Nairobi. Mm. And she said, come and visit me. Can you believe it? OK. Wow. And so, and so I said, OK. I, I'd written to Adara Aruka. He never wrote back. So I just, on a whim, I went. I mean, it's a longer story. I went. I actually had a conference to go to um, in Moscow. And there was this old airline, Aeroflow, that would get you very cheaply to Nairobi if you didn't mind stopping five times and transferring <laughs> in Moscow. So it all worked out. And uh, so I just showed up. And I always remember because the chair, Jack Odiamo, said, 
Doc, you must be Dr. Presidy. He goes, we thought you were a man. I go, no, I'm not. <laughs> so anyway, I found the Dararuka. He was very happy. He apologetic. He said, I lost your letter. It was in my car. Somebody stole my car. I didn't know how to write you back. But then he really encouraged me to study. And at mm. that point, I was just there for six weeks in the summer. Mm -hmm. So he wanted me to come back, and I did. Mm. And so I was able to uh, come back. And uh, first of all, I read a lot in 93. Uh, I read several dissertations by other people who had mm. done sage philosophy. So by the time I came back in 95, I knew a lot about it. And the plan was for Adara Uruka to spend the fall with me, teaching me sage philosophy, taking me on interviews, which he did. And in the winter, he was supposed to be my sabbatical replacement. Mm -hmm. But as you know, he died right. in December in that car crash. Right. Right. So right. He, he never replaced me. But I did have those months prior to his death. We did do interviews together. So I got a chance not only to see how he interviews people and meeting people. We interviewed people he was very close to and had known for years. So it was great to see that rapport. Uh, but anyway, what is sage philosophy? <laughs> so, you know, at the time, uh, African philosophy was a field that was uh, growing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And right. there was a big debate about what is it, right? right. And Placide Temples was a missionary who was making generalizations about Bantu philosophy. Right. And then those generalizations were being criticized by Paul and Hitanji and others. Uh, but I really think of Adira Aruka's Sage Philosophy Project as trying to be a middle ground, saying, uh, yes, we need a modern Africa with rigorous philosophical thought, but we shouldn't dismiss our sages and our traditions because they are rigorous mm -hmm. thinkers. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I think he, he was too much on the idea of philosophy is an argument where you make claims and you defend your right. claims. Right. And so he really wanted to go into the rural areas and show that people could defend their claim, their assertions with rational arguments. And if you look at the very beginnings of what he wrote, he was always emphasizing, it's not religious, it's rational, right. and it's discourse. Uh, but through the years, he softens right. uh, and begins to realize that, you know, meaning is expressed in uh, societies in many different ways. And so he... And he, he really has a nuanced view. He mm -hmm. wants Africa to rise to the, to the challenges of the day, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not by jettisoning the past traditions wholesale and, as he would call, worshiping Eurocentric ideas of modernity. Mm -hmm. That was not the way to do it. And so he was interested in the sages showing the thoughtfulness mm -hmm. of of African intellectuals and to ensure that they were included in, in a history of philosophy mm -hmm. and a body of philosophical works so as to avoid Eurocentrism and presumptions that all the good ideas come from the West and Africa is behind. He was well, very much a critic of that kind of thing. Right. And, you know, in some ways, he's he's the perfect one to be doing that project, it seems to me. I mean, he's trained, in, you know, at, at Uppsala and in, uh, at Wayne State as well, right? Yes, my neighbor, my neighboring. Institute. Right, exactly. Yes. You know, and, and he, he holds in some ways, I mean, you already mentioned the, you know, pushing back against, you know, uh, this is not just religion. And he's also pushing back against in some, it seems to me, a, a kind of view that this is all just anthropology as well. Right. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not just traditional folkways and stuff like that. This is real philosophy being done. Okay. And so Adair uh, Ruka was always like, no, this isn't anthropology. This right. is philosophy. And sometimes I think he was maybe a little too critical, like he made a straw man out of anthropology. Sure. Because a really nuanced idea of anthropology, like Clifford Geertz, who has a real appreciation for philosophy, 
would be doing a lot right. of the things that that right. we would think would be important to do in a in an interview. So so sometimes I think he's um, unfair. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. an anthropologist could say, you know, dear Ruka, you have to be a little more careful how you present <laughs> your interviews. Right. Is this verbatim? Are you right. interpreting, mm -hmm. etc. Right. So right. to just right. be clear about things like that, which is an important part of anthropological method. Mm -hmm. But the thing that he wanted to say, no, 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 it can't be an anthropologist, a philosopher has to do this, is because he thought that the person who who converses with the sage should challenge them. Mm. Just like mm. he says, Socrates always challenged people mm. in his dialogues. Mm. Whereas, you know, the anthropologist is thinking, you know, I shouldn't make judgments and I shouldn't right. interfere. I should take a back seat and just describe. Adira Ruka actually wanted his people to, either he himself or his people, right. to right. raise, it, push, the philosopher to go a little further and clarify a little more right. and he thought only a philosopher could do that of course you have to do it carefully because right. you could end up asking a leading question right. or you could end up you know misinterpreting uh the person you're interviewing so you do have to be careful about doing that but well, it seems, it, it seems to me you it seems to me you challenged oruka himself in a certain sense didn't you because uh, if left to his own advices, he would have only interviewed men. Okay, so yes, it's <laughs> not a hundred percent because in his book, his sage philosophy book, where he had eighteen right. interviews, one of them was a woman. Okay. But you could say one out of eighteen is not. <laughs> and you know, I always asked the Daruka, and and he never said he purposefully. He just would say things. You know, it's hard. It's hard to find a woman to interview. He'd say things like that. And I'm like, come on, really? <laughs> um, now, there may be some more interviews that he did that he did not include in the book. So okay. the thing is, and I have heard, you know, doing oral interviews with people who participated in his project, they'll say, we had a hundred interviews. There were piles of interviews. Then we had to decide what to put in the book. Right. So somehow they decided on 18. But we know that there were more women interviewed, for example, uh, when Adira Aruka is doing his uh, testimony for the SM Otiano trial, he mm -hmm. mentions the names of a couple of women sages he interviewed on these mm -hmm. topics, but we have not seen or found right. those interviews. So, so it's a little unfortunate that some of, some of that uh, research is, has been missing. So but you yourself, but problem. you yourself did some. You yourself did some interviews with some some women sages, I believe, didn't you? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. So yes, I was very interested uh, in doing that, and and Odera Ruka and I almost interviewed a woman together, and then he decided, no, conditions are not right. We're not going to do <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, but I did uh, subsequently, and I had a lot of help. Uh, Chaungo Barasa right. is included in Adara Ruka's book as the youngest sage, but he would call himself a sage is somebody who's a proponent of sage philosophy. He's a right. little humble, but Adara uh, Ruka says, no, you're, you're a sage. Right. And Shongo Barasa was not trained as a philosopher, but as a water engineer. But right. he was so interested in philosophy because of his interest in a Kopi Vitek mm -hmm. that Hmm. that Barasa joined Adara Aruka's Philosophical Association of Kenya just out of self-interest hmm. to study philosophy. And he ended up not only helping Adara Aruka with some of the interviews that ended up in the book, but also helping me with subsequent That's uh, interviews. That's really great. Yeah. So I'm interested in, the, in, in what would actually happen. So you were with Aruka in the field. Um, did did sages get questions in advance or were they just simply asked on the spot or how did how did Aruka formulate his questions i mean you know of the million things he could ask why why did he take make some choices rather than others how did he identify sages um you know like what were the mechanics of of this whole process okay so there were the first you know he announces in 1974 he's starting sage philosophy right and then through the 80s, he does some interviews 
And those were a little different than the interviews I did with him in 1995. Because really, when he started the project, he used a lot of assistance. He didn't necessarily do, he did a few interviews. For example, we know he interviewed his own father, Aruka Rodinia, yes. who's in the right. book. But a lot of the other interviews were done by the various graduate students in the Department of Philosophy. And they were each sent to areas where they had some mm. uh, linguistic expertise and where they would have the connections to mm. know. Mm -hmm. And so the sages were identified by the ones who had interests in certain questions. Okay. Right? Who has an interest in these questions and discussing these questions at length? Mm -hmm. And Adira Ruka knew there were such persons because mm -hmm. he grew up himself in a rural area of, you know, Ugenya in uh, what was called Nansa province at that time, right. and right. all the way near the Uganda border. And right. he mm -hmm. knew just watching his father that there would be long philosophical discussions between the elders. And so really, the criteria was who wants to discuss these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the assistants would go. Now, for better or worse, the assistants, since they're kind of deputized by Aruka, right. show up with a list of philosophical questions that okay. we could say, well, these are kind of dictated by, you know, Western philosophy interests. Um, but that's how the first round went. Okay. Um, and I myself felt like, you know, if you read the anthropology a little more carefully, they would say better to have open ended questions or just to let the person talk and right. see what right. they do. And now this isn't, this was known for a long time. I mean, actually, Huntanji back in 1974 wrote an article about Paul, Paul Redin, uh, who wrote Primitive Man as Philosopher, and I know the title. Is right. controversial, but but uh, Radin did think that uh, there were uh, philosopher intellectuals in mm -hmm. every community, including Africa and Native America. Those were his two uh, big examples right. in the book. Right, and he also said, you know, the interview isn't all. I'm I'm so glad you're interviewing me. This is no critique, but <laughs> the interview is not the best scenario for learning wisdom from the sages. Right. Better to listen to them uninterruptedly. Right. And then right. Huntanji even turned to uh, Marcel Griol, and of course we don't know whether that was Griol's real method or not. Conversations with the God Amelie. Yes, but at least he portrays it as right. every day our tells Griol what he wants to say. And, you know, Griol yeah. just right. it down. Over what, uh, 30, 30 days or something like that? It was, it was something yes. like that. Yeah, so, you know, right. people don't know if he gave it that structure right. after the fact or right. not. Right. But there's the idea of, you know, listening. But again, remember, Aruka wants people to raise critical questions. Right. So when I was with him and he would usually just let me ask the questions because he's showing me around, introducing me to sages. Okay. I would always save my critical questions for the end, right. just in case. They got people upset. I would have had the best <laughs> interview already. Right. But you know, after a few hours go by. Right. And I want to say some of these interviews went a long time. Well, the ones with the Dararuka could go on two or three hours. Wow. But for example, Humphrey Ojuang from University right. of Nairobi, he mm -hmm. also helped mm -hmm. me do a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. Some of our interviews were 10 hours long. Oh my God. Like Care Adala wow. Otuko. And it's funny because I had a cassette player, right? And I'm doing the cassette. And at a certain point, we're running out of cassette. There goes the music. I have to find <laughs> music cassettes and record over the music because I can't let this interview stop. I don't wow. have another blank cassette. Um, but, but I mean, great, great, very interesting interviews. Yeah. Full of nuance yeah. about, about not only how, how do you philosophize, but how do you lead and how do you get other people to discern what would mm. be for them a morally right, right uh, uh, action to take in a particular dilemma because right. really a lot of the sages are working in this situation right. they do have 
theoretical reflections about the guidance they give, right. but they're called upon uh, in, you could say, instance after instance of we're in a fix. And how do you do that? And, and Aruka makes this distinction early on between what he calls the folk sages and philosophical sages. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, um, you know, what what is he going to, what is he looking for as the difference between those two things? Okay, so, uh, you know, interviewing people uh, who were part of the project, they say those categories were thought up after the fact. Interesting. In a pile of interviews, how are we going to organize them? Okay. But mm -hmm. I think there's maybe something a little unfortunate in the way he made the decision, the, the distinction, because it makes it sound, first of all, can one person really be one or the other? So supposedly mm. the folk sage is someone who can tell you what the community thinks on a certain issue, but it does not critically evaluate what the community thinks. And the philosophical sage is supposed to be the individual making critical discernments. Okay. okay. So first of all, I think probably all of us are both of that. Of course, well, I mean, which one of us has already gone through everything we ever thought and rigorously evaluated <laughs> it, right? right. Uh, and uh, second of all, it does sometimes seem to suggest that the ones who are most critical of their own society are more philosophical. Right. But you could have a nuanced defense of your society's position. Yeah. But it definitely focuses on the individual. Adara Ruka wanted to focus on the individual thinker because he thought people were belittling Africa by suggesting people here all have groupthink. Right. Well, I always but, took that as, an, as a kind of response to Huntanji in a certain sense, right? Because Huntanji insists so much that uh, ethno-philosophy is this philosophy that's universally and uncritically held. And so Aruka turns around and says, well, we're going to find individuals now that are rooted in Africa and yet have this philosophical ability. So it felt to me like a you know, almost a direct response to Huntanji's challenge. Right. And like I say, Odero Ruka is someone trying to find a middle ground between right. these two positions. Uh, but, and, and it's good, but I do think that maybe some others have come to like a better um, middle ground or a more nuanced middle ground. For example, when I think of uh, Campbell S. Momo from uh, Nigeria, mm -hmm. Right. Now, he was somebody who studied with uh, William Abraham and Yvonne Karp, so yep. anthropologists. Right. And he goes back to Nigeria and interviews elders in Nigeria at length and, uh, and then evaluates the, the um, interviews. But the thing about Momo is he will refer to his sages as conveying their wisdom in a variety of ways, including mm -hmm. uh, storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, proverbs, mm -hmm. and he and and Momo will also include observations of the interactions of the sage at work, talking mm -hmm. to other members of the community mm -hmm. in a way that Adara Rupus is more like just this one person. And uh, so I really think that, uh, I mean, I, I think we can learn something from both of them, but Adara Ruka, you know, and maybe over time, he also nuanced uh, the way he did these interviews, because even though he focused so much on individuals, here's someone with a name, and it's important, and a lot of Africans want to have their names connected. They don't want to be anonymized or right. generalized. So it's important to connect a name, but it's yeah. also important to put the context and say these yeah. individuals are philosophizing in a context where some of the concepts they are using are created by and provided by their society. And right. that's not a bad thing. That is a part of their philosophy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it seems to me... Um you know, one of, one of the possible uh, limitations of Aruka's method is when he thinks about being critical, it almost always feels like a sort of divergence, like here's, here's 
you know, societal wisdom and being critical means diverging from that in some way. So critiquing it means, well, they think <clears throat> they think this, but I think this other thing. And it seems you just mentioned the you know the idea of uh, uh, concepts being created, uh, you know, thinking in a place, thinking in a space. And it seems to me it's every bit as much a kind of critical faculty to create concepts that are adequate to the space you find yourself in. And that's a broader sense that maybe we find in MoMA or, or some other uh, figures as well. It's really the attempt to make philosophy, which we often think of as a universalizing uh, enterprise into something that can only be universalizing by coming out of the place that it's in. Yes, I did wanna say also that even though Deruca and Sage Philosophy is like the individual and here's the portrait and here's the, sto the right. life story and the, here's what they say. He also engages in cultural philosophy, sure. the philosophy of the Luo. And he wants to go to court and be an expert witness in the philosophy and the practices and the meaning behind the practices yeah. of the yeah. Luo community. And so, and he actually runs workshops for like uh, district officers and policemen. Right. On how to understand the people you have to police, you know, this is their philosophy. So it's not like he'll never do any generalization, even though his sage philosophy right. was all about saying right. there's an individual. And I do want to say though, I mean, he did a lot of work on Luo philosophy, but the broader picture of sage philosophy was supposed to be an opportunity for Kenyans to learn the wisdom mm -hmm. of all their elders from mm -hmm. different parts of Kenya, from different ethnic communities, and to appreciate them all as a common heritage of mm -hmm. wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why he put together his book the way he did, mm -hmm. with interviews from many different parts of the country. And mm -hmm. he could do that because he had so many assistants who each right. went to their area of Kenya. Right. Yeah, no, so it's really he, a powerful project, isn't it? It's really um, something that that is meant to contribute back to the community and not just be in in the halls of academia, you know, to be argued over by by you know trained philosophers. Right, right, and so and really, that's also then the critique of the role of academia in Africa. He sees it as having a, a, a colonizing, well, the idea that now an institution has a monopoly on knowledge. And if right. you don't get your degree from there, you right. are considered not knowledgeable. Right. What happens to the life experience? What happens to knowledge handed down through families right. and communities? Right. It's belittled. And so he was working against that marginalization yeah. of, of African knowledge. Yeah, it's really it's really a, a powerful idea, and you know I you know I'm just struck by how much it extends. You know, you talked a bit about this before, but how it extends for him into questions about the environment and questions about uh, you know peace and justice and questions about law and I mean he's just really you know he's he's not going to be contained by you know like one little furrow that he's going to plow. You know, I mean you've done work on uh, on other traditions. You've done a lot of work on Gandhi. And, and others, and I'm wondering if you can speak to how you see, uh, or whether you see, you know, there being uh, conversations, overlaps, you know, with someone like Aruka, or maybe just philosophy in Kenya more generally, um, you know, and some of the things you've seen in India and other places. Yes, well, uh, let me tell you a, uh, a little bit about his social and political philosophy, right. his ethics, his interest in ethics, because right. really that what, those were his studies from when he first started studying philosophy at Uppsala with Ingemar Hedinius. And Hedinius was someone who was really, we could call him a public philosopher. Mm -hmm. He had a weekly column in the newspaper. He was always addressing mm -hmm. issues of uh, social justice in Sweden and, and societal reform. Those were big things for Hedinius. And Hedinius was very involved in critiquing the system of policing mm. prisons and punishment in mm. Sweden. And Hedinius really argued that, you know, we misunderstand crime. We want to blame the individual. We don't look at the social forces right. to create the context in which individuals 
uh, make their acts and decisions and in which individual's character is developed, we have to pay more attention to the context. And then we need to devise a, a, a solution that's more of a healing solution. Mm -hmm. So Adara Ruka was very interested in this. And since you mentioned he also went to Wayne State, well, that's uh, partly because Hedinius went from Uppsala to Wayne State oh. to teach in 1968. It was right after Detroit had had a riot. Mm. And so it was a time when society was really socially strained and when there were these dual narratives about riots or rebellion. It's like the one side is saying, you know, you're storing us, you're treating us unjustly. When we raise our voices, you call us criminals. And so Adura Ruka wrote his master's thesis on the question of punishment. Mm. And he said some things that they really sound like what we've been hearing uh, from Black Lives Matter and other movements mm. uh, lately. Adura Ruka said, the only role for police is to put the criminal in an ambulance so that they can go get treatment. <laughs> you know, wow. It's the only role for police. Um, and so Adara Ruka develops these ideas into his first published book, Punishment and Terrorism in Africa, which is- That one right there. Thank you, thanks a lot. So, <laughs> and you could say this was a really daring book because it was critiquing some of the authoritarian right. um, governments that were treating uh, people quite cruelly, just locking up, dissidents, you know, as criminals, and uh, the role of torture and everything. And this is something Adara Ruka knew a lot of people right. in Kenya knew it, they, they experienced it firsthand. Right. Of course, they had experienced it during uh, colonialism from the British with the, who tried to root out the Mau Mau and used uh, detention right. and torture. But even in independent Kenya, there was not as much political freedom as there should have been. There was like one party rule for a long time. And uh, many uh, colleagues of Adara Rufus, like Casper Odegi, who by the way, just passed away last week, mm. if you oh, remember wow. him from Nairobi. Yeah, wow. He was tortured by Moy in those prisons and Adara Ruka himself was harassed many times and felt that his life was threatened, his house was right. searched, right. et cetera. I was going to bring up the question of 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 his status under under Moy's government, um, you know, throughout those basically single party days all the way up until the 90s. Right. So Adira Ruka really advocated this idea of democracy right. and, and individual liberty, yet accountability. He, right. uh, he wanted a, a society that was humane right. and, and and both on a national level like he saw in Sweden. So he saw, he would contrast the United States and Sweden and see Sweden as an example where there was more concern for people's basic needs. Right. And then he argued the world has to be a place like this where right. people receive their basic needs and not as an act of charity, but as an act of justice. And right. he would talk about the ways in which Poverty was caused by injustice. Mm. So those were some of his key concerns. Mm. And he was very active in an international way. He was involved in FISP, the Federation of International Philosophical Societies, and he was very active on their human rights committee. Right. And he so he was always advocating for uh, an end to uh, poverty, an end to mm. racism, mm. an end to war. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wrote about that and so many of his articles and he always wanted to stay in Kenya right. and by right. the way I found out too like reading his correspondence and everything he was actually offered a job in Florida Bruce he could have been <laughs> your neighbor he could have been like Kwasi Weridu was he declined wow. he said he should stay in Kenya. He was needed in Kenya. Wow. And he, then he said some like things about it. And the United States is no picnic, you know, all their racism, et cetera. Right. So he had a critique of our, right. our society, but right. he, he was very dedicated to uh, staying in Kenya. Right. 
And even though it, it gave him a lot of stress and concern. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, really such a such an incredibly rich uh, career. What how would you how would you characterize his his effect since since his death uh, on on African philosophy? Do you do you see him as having a longstanding uh, uh, effect, or or maybe he uh, should have more of an effect than he does? Uh, what would you how would you characterize that? Well, I mean, luckily there are some people who and yourself included who are continuing some of these interests, and as you know, uh, Kai Kressa, our who's friend Kai Kressa, yes, rising yeah. in Mombasa. And there, so there are others who are continuing the interest even in his ethics and social philosophy. We can always wish there would be more, but there is some. And, right. uh, and his views are also uh, noticed. And uh, there are several Nigerians who write about Ajara Ruka, about his sage philosophy project, right. or right. about it in comparison with other approaches to right. African philosophy. And, you know, uh, Adair Ruka had spent a year in, in Nigeria during mm. uh, his very first uh, sabbatical. He oh, went to oh. Nigeria. He said, everyone else wants to go to Europe for their sabbatical, but he wanted to go to Nigeria to try to understand African philosophy better from right. that right. Uh, perspective. And he had some uh, close friendships and associations with uh, Nigerian scholars, and and several of them are still uh, writing ab about him. Godwin Azenabor, uh, Fayemi Kazim, uh, mm -hmm. Adamala. So right. uh, so there there continues to be some authors, but I mean we can always ask the broader questions of this. The social and political questions, of course, are are a very important part of contemporary right. African philosophy. Whether or not people refer to Odera Aruka, right. it's still a, a robust area of uh, discussion. And right. what right. counts as uh, how to respond to what counts as racism, how to respond to racism, people are still addressing that issue. It's very important right. how to address ongoing problems of poverty and right. neo-colonialism are being addressed by a host of a younger generation of scholars interested in African philosophy. You know, I, I sometimes make this distinction between what I call a mode of thought and a space of thought. Um, and, and a mode of thought is a, a way of thinking. And I think often, especially people outside of Africa, have looked for African philosophy to be a, a mode of thought. In other words, a way of thinking. That is somehow has a some kind of central unity to it, and what strikes me about someone like Aruka, you know, especially in the context of a lot of the other discourse around social, political issues, decolonial issues, and so forth, is that people often in uh, Africa will will go to figures like Fanon and and Stephen Biko, as in, uh, important as they are, and they are absolutely crucial for that conversation. Aruka is doing something slightly different than what they're doing, and yet still talking about some very, you know, similar kinds of problems and issues. And so I, I think that adds to the richness of, of this space of thought. In other words, it's not a, just a single way of thinking in Africa. There's multiple ways of thinking, and Aruka is not the only one, I think. But but you know, he he's an example of somebody who, who stretches the broad the and broadens the conversation. Yes, and it's interesting that you mentioned Fanon because actually he learned, he studied Fanon as a graduate student from Hedinius, and Hedinius was forced to teach Marx and Fanon because the Uppsala students had a big protest saying they wanted to learn it and the department had to provide it. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's great. Yes. So Aruka would often refer to Fanon and others, but he also learned about Gandhi, not from Hedinius, but because there was this organization, the Afro-Asian Philosophical Association. And that was one of those, you could say, South-South uh, right. sharings where, why do we always have to compare ourselves to Europe? Right. Let's learn African and Asian uh, philosophy from each other. Right. And so Adair Aruka was very active in that group. And near the end of his life, he did write an article about Gandhi. Hmm, and, interesting. And, you know, reflecting on, you know, when I was younger, I 
you know, starting with Anon, but now that I see levels of violence in the world, the, to the extent that I do, I think that uh, we really need to uh, stop physical violence. And he referred to parts of, of the philosophy of Gandhi that he agreed with. He agreed that we are all interconnected, but he said, mm -hmm. I mean this scientifically, not, not from a religious perspective. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't mm -hmm. saying he had a vision of spiritual unity. He was right. saying, if you look at nature and environment and sociology, all these things, we are all so interconnected. And mm -hmm. he thought that could be proven as a scientific fact. And because of that, we needed an environmental philosophy mm -hmm. And the philosophy of nonviolence. So it was interesting to to see some of his uh, reflections on Gandhi. But I did find it interesting. There's one thing on which he disagreed with Gandhi, hmm. because Gandhi talked about this, uh, you know, truth. You know, we need to listen to everyone, and you know, listen to everybody's truth to a certain extent. You know, this kind of Jain Jain idea. Right. And uh, Aruka wanted to say. Uh, but I have the right to have an argument and win an argument <laughs> with somebody, et cetera. And so he, he wanted to, to protect his ability to engage in intellectual violence. Huh. And I thought, no, too bad he didn't read, you know, so many of our feminist thinkers are going, now is this the right way to talk about reason and argument and philosophy? I still have to win and I have to defeat you with my argument. <laughs> So, but Adair Aruka went halfway down the Gandhi road. He said, no physical violence, oh, but he, he still wanted to have a philosophical argument and win it. <laughs> That's really interesting. Well, um, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I have one more uh, question for you. I've, 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 kept, uh, I've kept you on the line here uh, a long time, but um, it's, a, it's a question about stepping back and thinking about the, I guess, the, maybe the next generations of, of uh, uh, students interested in philosophy. And I'm wondering how you bring, uh, or you get students interested in, not just in philosophy maybe, but African philosophy in particular. Like what, do, is there any book? Is there any idea? Do you use Aruka's work? Do you use something else? Um, how, do, how, does, how, do, how, do you, how do you draw students in? Okay, so when I teach African philosophy, I like to begin at the beginning with ancient Egypt. Then right. I go, you know, there's been a long, uh, a long history of, of thought from the continent of Africa. And we even said, right. what is Africa? Is it a continent? You know, right. I talk about Ali Mazuri and other ideas. Right. And I start with that critique of Eurocentrism. I bring in Sylvia Federici. Mm -hmm. We're so used to a curriculum that presumes that the the best and greatest ideas of the world all came from Europe. Right. So we really have to rethink it. And so I like going step by step through some of the history of Africa and showing uh, key ideas from ancient Egypt, from North Africa, from Timbuktu, all of those places. And then, you know, and then I get like to the Akan of Ghana, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, and one of those who provides an interesting debunking of this idea of, of, of Eurocentrism is Sophie Olawole from uh, Nigeria. She's got a book, uh, Socrates and Oren Mila, yes. which I think is a great uh, challenge. You know, everyone agrees, oh, Socrates is a philosopher, even though he didn't write anything down, right? He's an oral philosopher. Plato writes things down. And then she goes, well, really, there are the, the important uh, literary corpus, the oral literary corpus now written down, the Odu Ifa mm -hmm. of the Oruba people, which mm -hmm. she taught herself. Wow. And they are filled with philosophical ideas. And a key author is, is Oren Mila. And some say, oh, he's a mythic guy. He's an Orisha. He's a, a, he's a religious person, a god. And she goes, no, the Orisha, she says, they're like Catholic saints. They were once human beings. You know, they've been deified. But she wants to say, Oren Mila walked on earth and he was, he was from the same time period as Socrates. And actually, they have a lot of things in common. Mm, and so it's very interesting when she talks about Oren Mila. 
how it, their idea of values and virtues, you know, uh, virtue is more important than money. And, uh, but she also talks about Oren Mila having this idea of knowledge is always tentative. Mm -hmm. She wants to say, if you go way back thousands of years to Oren Mila's philosophy, don't think that because it's in the past, it's a tradition, it's dogma, and people are just repeating it unthinkingly. No, there is critical engagement. Mm -hmm. And Oren Mila was also someone who wanted a very inclusive society. Mm -hmm. Every society should listen to men, should listen to women, mm -hmm. should listen to youth, and sh should listen to the foreigners, those who mm -hmm. are not from there. Listen to everybody. Mm -hmm. They are all, they should all participate in society, mm -hmm. they all have knowledge. And so I really like how she's tried to construct this ancient African philosophy from an oral tradition. And I think she gives a good argument for being able to do it. So I would definitely have people re and she's got so many uh, videos of, of herself. She's like you, Bruce. She's being <laughs> interviewed on the interviews right. or, or she uh, puts forward her own right. uh, series of lectures, which you can still Google on YouTube and uh, find them. Right. But, uh, but there are other contemporary uh, people. I, and a lot of times I have guest speakers just like you do. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, happy to get uh, Bernard Madalino not too long ago. He came right. for African Studies Association and he came and I said, there's a couple of your papers I think our students would be really interested in. And one was, he talked about the question, you know, uh, this whole question of reverse racism. Can a black mm -hmm. person right. be racist? Can a white person in South Africa say, I'm suffering from racism? And it's a very sensitive topic, but he has a very careful nuanced argument and the students found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. And he, Madalena was also willing to take a look at something that most people run away from, which is this question of, of gender identities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, same sex relationships. Right. And he wanted to understand right. the criticisms from some African perspectives, but also draw upon some African ideas to have a critique of the uh, ostracization of mm -hmm. such persons. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, I think that just having those contemporary issues addressed by contemporary African philosophers right. is a good way to mm -hmm. get students really interested. And they all go there and, and, you know, just like any of us, we all have to say, God, I didn't know this about Africa before <laughs> I just yeah. heard about it. You know, so we really need as a society here in, in, a, in the United States, we right. really yeah. need more just basic literacy about right. what's going right. on in Africa. And then some learning yeah. about the philosophical yeah. debate that are important in contemporary America today. Yeah, you know, when you and I were, and Kai and others were in Kenya in the 1990s, it felt like there were a certain number, a small number of people interested in African philosophy. And it feels like now you can multiply that number by 10. I mean, it just seems like there's so many more people, you know, engaged in, in all sorts of different ways in African philosophy. And so it's quite exciting, really, because, you know, if you're looking for those young scholars like Dr. Madalino, you know, they're there to be found. I mean, they really are. Yes, and there are people addressing environmental ethics issues who are African philosophers discussing yeah, absolutely. issues, right. but right. drawing on African wisdom to address them right. and mm -hmm. drawing on the other Western scholars as well. So it's not just a one thing right. or another. Right, right. But finding the resources wherever they lie to address these large contemporary problems. Yeah. Well, I think we're we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, thanks to Dr. Gail Presby for being in conversation with me today, and uh, for for this really great insight into Aruka and Sage philosophy and doing philosophy in Africa and all the rest of that. So, thanks again. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, and I can only hope that something that we have said together this time, or that you and others have said in your entire series will encourage everyone listening to learn more and more about right. this very uh, interesting and, and ever-changing topic of yeah. African philosophy. Absolutely, absolutely agree. So thank you very much, and we will see everyone next time.